ladies and gentlemen, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on when you're going to watch this TV news, brought to you by the Alliance TV, supported by the so-called Eurosceptic parties. We prefer to call ourselves Eurorealists. The Alliance for Direct Democracy in Europe, ADDE. The idea is to reinform you with topics, subjects, approaches, which are not covered by the official TV channels. Information is mismanaged, cleansed, edited to fill the official picture. A good example is the real invasion of illegal migrants from the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa, which takes place now. The official channels show you women and children, while 90% of migrants are young men of 25 to 35. It is hidden to the European population, though it is a fact. Today we'll have several sequences to present, but before, let me introduce you to the editor of Alliance TV, Michael Mondrikamen, the president of the Belgian-French-speaking Parti Populaire, member of ADD. Hello, Michael. Um, what will be the public of this TV news? Clearly, the aim is to reach European citizens, whatever the countries. We want to bring, a, as you said, a different information which is not formatted or reformatted, uh, to bring these realities to the people straightforward. And for this, we have this extraordinary tool, which are the uh, uh, social networks, uh, Twitter and Facebook, uh, whereby we can obviously bring information straightforward to the citizen in bypassing the media. I can say to some extent we want to uberize the traditional media and their distortion. So, how often will it be shown or presented or aired? Well, everybody needs to, to understand that it's a tremendous effort for an organization like ourselves also to, to start presenting uh, TV news like this. So, we will start modestly, I would say, with uh, two TV shows per month. Once we'll be in a shorter term with only some subject, uh, and the other one, uh, also once a month, this, uh, will be with one guest. And we will go a little deeper on the subject by exchanging with, with this guest ideas and, and uh, going deeper into the details, yes. One expression you don't like is political correctness. Well, the essence of this kind of TV show is to be in total uh, uh, breakdown with political correctness. Uh, we, are, we feel compelled, we feel obliged to edit ourselves news because of political correctness that we reject. But you know, uh, you can lie to the people, to the ordinary people about what's going far away, you know, uh, but you cannot lie to them about their direct environment. They see a kind of invasion uh, that they are currently facing. They see that the rise of violence uh, is, is, is growing. They see that their taxes are also higher and higher every year, while uh, uh, unemployment is also rising. Uh, they, they also see, for example, in many countries, that the bill for gas and energy is exploding uh, in order to support the craziness of, of green policies. So, and then they, they, they have the news where they say that it's, everything is normal, all this uh, in Europe, that uh, Europe goes in the right direction, and they feel totally unbalanced and uncomfortable. So we will, to some extent, uh, put again the links between the dots and put all this in perspective and, and just show with our news that they are right to be uncomfor uncomfortable with this, this, this reality. And this is the main aim of our news channel. Thank you, Michael. Now we go over to the first topic, which is actually making the headlines for month and month already. The invasion across the Mediterranean of people coming from the war-torn Middle East and from sub-Saharan Africa, where poverty is endemic. What are the main real figures? Who is responsible for this total inefficiency of Europe? How would it develop a report by our team? It actually started to get out of control in the spring of 2015. Behind this real invasion of Europe, the first reason is the Arab Spring, when most North African and Arab countries toppled their autocratic leaders. Hope for the appearance of democracy was short-lived. It is an ugly form of Islamism which is triumphant in many countries. 
or else democracy is weak and very much threatened by religious fanatics. The worst place of all is of course Syria, where a civil war has torn the country apart. The war opposes the official government of Bashar al-Assad and many factions among the Islamic states, also called Daesh. Syrians started to flee massively, first to Turkey and Lebanon, then more and more to Europe. At the same time, Libyans, after the fall of Gaddafi, started to flee their country to reach the marriage of a rich and welcoming Europe. The European Union, and especially the European Commission, called by its president, Jean-Claude Juncker, the Last Chance Commission, showed its total inefficiency in simply applying its own legislation and stopping the illegal migrants before they reached the shores of Italy, Greece or Spain. At the same time, unexpectedly, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel announced that all migrants, and not only war refugees, were welcome in Germany, where the booming economy requires trained workers. That was the beginning of an incredible rush, a never-seen-before invasion. Black migrants from Africa, the whole of the Middle East, and people from as far as Iraq, Chechnya, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan flooded the Balkans, Sicily, the south of Europe, in order to reach the promised land, Germany. The German model type of organization was rapidly overrun by the crowd. The Germans themselves were astounded at the undiscussed decision of Mrs. Merkel and felt betrayed. First of all in Bavaria, where the minister-president, Horst Seehofer, openly criticized the chancellor in no uncertain terms, and even welcomed the pariah of Europe, Viktor Orban, Prime Minister of Hungary, to a joint press conference in Munich. Viktor Orban had been the cleverest European leader and had immediately closed the eastern borders of Hungary, redirecting the crowds of migrants and obliging them to go through Macedonia, then Serbia, Croatia, entering the Schengen zone in Slovenia, Austria and finally Germany. Here you see the crowds in Macedonia, where the authorities don't have the means to tackle the influx from Greece. Germany had announced the country would welcome 800,000 migrants. They will get more than 1 million in 2015, and the flow is continuing unabated. In front of the rebellion of her party, Frau Merkel had to announce sheepishly that there were limits to what Germany could do. She could only plead, too late, for the flow to be spread to the other members of the European Union. There are now more than 1,200,000 new migrants in Europe. The vast majority are young Muslim men between the age of 25 and 35. They will want to regroup their families within a few years. The German government has given the astounding figure of the expected increase of the German population in three years' time. More than 7 million migrants will establish in Germany, nearly 10% of the population. Some fear a rapid Islamization of the country, which already hosts a large Turkish community that has kept the dual nationality, Turkish and German. Many in ADDE and other political groupings also feared that the migrants would hide extremists and terrorists from ISIS in their midst. It is unfortunately a reality. Two of the jihadists that blew themselves up in the Paris attacks were recent migrants, arrived through Greece and Macedonia from Turkey. A main problem for the European Union is that the real refugees, who can ask for asylum, represent some 20% of the asylum seekers, but the others, once rejected, will not leave Europe. They will enter the grey or black work markets, enter drugs trade, slave work or prostitution. The president of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, is pathetic when he claims that this influx of mainly illiterate and unqualified people is a chance for Europe. 
Europe has an average of 10% unemployment. We cannot afford more. The migration issue is clearly playing a role in the British citizens' attitude towards the so-called Brexit, the referendum promised by the Prime Minister David Cameron, and the pressure from UKIP, the UK Independence Party, on Europe. Should the UK leave the European Union, here are the details. The law of the land will require that there must be a referendum on our EU membership by the end of 2017. A poll has just been conducted in the UK by the Servation Institute with an imposing participation of some 10,000 Britons on the possible outcome of the upcoming referendum. Main finding? A majority of Britons want to leave the EU. 42 versus 40 percent that want to remain in. 18 percent have not decided yet. David Cameron has asked his European colleagues at the last European summit in Brussels to help him keep Britain in. But the present total failure or lack of European policies makes a no vote a stronger possibility than ever and mostly among young people between 18 and 34. Other clear reaction. If the UK was not a member yet of the European Union, would you support or oppose a proposal for the UK to join the European Union? 41% of Britons say clearly no, while 35% would say yes. The no vote is clearly gaining ground. 63% of people support the idea that if the UK Parliament disagrees with the European Parliament, it should overrule them. National laws should prevail over European laws. 64% of Britons are not happy about the value for money of Europe. What must count as perhaps the worst piece of public policy seen in modern Europe for half a century, when you compounded the already failing and flawed EU common asylum policy by saying to the whole world, please come to Europe, and we saw, a, frankly, virtually a stampede, uh, and we learn that 80% of those that are coming are not Syrian refugees. In fact, what you've done is to open the door to young male economic migrants, many of whom, I have to say, behave in a rather aggressive manner, quite the opposite to what you would ever expect to see from any refugee. And yet, when that failure, when that failure, when that failure is met by objections from countries like Hungary, their opinions are crushed. This isn't a Europe of peace. It's a Europe of division. It's a Europe of disharmony. It's a Europe that is a recipe for resentment. And yet, faced with all this failure, both of you said the same thing today. You said Europe isn't working, so we must have more Europe. More of the same failing. Well, there is, I think, a bright star on the horizon. It's called the British Referendum. And given, given that none of you want to concede Britain the ability to take back control of our own borders, a Brexit now looks more likely than at any point in modern time. And I hope and pray that Britain voting to leave the European Union will be the beginning of the end of a project, however noble its original intentions, has gone rotten. In the present circumstances, it sounds like a real provocation. Jean-Claude Juncker, President of the European Commission, has decided to increase the salary of the Eurocrats, the European civil servants already overpaid and paying only limited taxes to Europe and not to their country of origin. Astonishing, isn't it? The 55,000 Eurocrats in Brussels, Strasbourg and Luxembourg will receive 2.4% more, above inflation from June last year, retroactively wonderful. It will cost us all, citizens of Europe, another 100 million euros per year. Bravo! It is true that the wages of the Eurocrats had been frozen for the last two years. But is the present financial crisis the right time for such an increase? Greece has not recovered yet, far from it, and economic indicators are not good. As a reminder, let us simply add that some 10,000 civil servants in Brussels earn more every month than the Prime Minister of Great Britain, David Cameron. In the last 10 years, the European bureaucracy has increased by 60%. In 2015 only, 
the number of European judges that receive 18,600 euros per month has practically doubled. These unacceptable salaries and perks of all kinds include, for example, the 16% remoteness premium for being far away from home to all non-Belgians in Brussels. This bonus is not taxed. All this feeds what is called Europhobia among European citizens who struggle to make ends meet every month. At the same time, Europeans don't see any clear decision coming out of the endless discussions taking place in Brussels and other capitals on the real issues facing Europe. Polls. Polls are made and used across Europe to feel the pulse of the people. Often, they don't seem to reflect the reality of results at elections and are very different from what was announced by the polling institutes. Here is an interesting reaction on the way these polls can be manipulated. It comes from Philippe de Villiers, a respectable politician on the right of the political spectrum in France, who is now retiring. His reaction about polls. Sur le point de trouver du gaz de schiste, c'est-à-dire qu'en fait on creusait, on creusait, on était, euh, on était à 1, 2%, c'était désespérant, à tel point que Jimmy Goldsmith s'était reparti chez lui au Mexique. Et j'essaye de le rattraper, et il me dit qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire Je dis, ben écoutez, euh, d'après ce qu'on m'explique, moi je découvre un peu le système, il faudrait acheter les sondages, et pendant, pendant trois mois, quoi, euh, même s'il n'y a qu'un mois. Euh, <rire> Avant l'élection, euh, voilà, il faut leur lancer un message. Et puis peut-être, euh, il me dit, mais pendant que vous y êtes, achetez TF1. Je dis, chiche. Et donc, euh, Jimmy Goldsmith, à la bourse, euh, a acheté 4,99% de TF1, parce qu'il était bloqué, à, on n'avait pas le droit d'acheter plus. Jimmy a acheté des sondages de trois instituts pendant trois mois. Qu'est-ce qui s'est passé il s'est passé qu'en huit jours, tout a changé. En huit jours, tout a changé. En huit jours, on est, on est passé de 2 à 10 dans les sondages. Et euh, j'ai compris après. Et en huit jours, on a eu toutes les émissions, évidemment, de TF1, etc. Euh, 7 sur 7 d'Anne Sinclair, le 20h, etc. Et donc, en fait, ce que j'ai compris, c'est que pour faire de la politique à un haut niveau, il faut avoir un énorme budget. Ce n'est pas une question d'affiche, tout ça, de, de payer les avions, les trains. Ce n'est pas ça, c'est les sondages. Si vous n'avez pas un gros budget de sondage, vous n'êtes pas dans l'offre, comme disent les sondeurs. C'est-à-dire, ils vous mettent dans l'offre si vous payez. Et en fait, les sondages qui paraissent dans les journaux, ils ne sont pas achetés par les journaux. Ils sont achetés par les hommes politiques, par les partis politiques. And now something completely different, a reaction by women who declare themselves ecologists on the left of the political spectrum about having children. Is it a good idea for us Europeans to still have children? It is a recent article in the French Le Figaro. Several young women speak about their refusal to have children because of the evolution of the world. They are called ginks for green inclination, no kids. They are convinced that overpopulation of the planet has an effect on climate warming. Therefore, they don't want to have children. It is one of the strange results of the Paris Conference on Climate Change, the COP21. These ginks, or women with green inclination, no kids, refuse to have children in order to save the planet. How crazy can you be? Their slogan is, if you like children, don't give birth to them because the world is a rubbish bin. These green feminists are not numerous, but very vocal. Lisa Hymas, American writer and co-founder of the blog Grist.com, started this movement. They refuse to be egotists and refuse to have children for the sake of humanity. On Facebook, they have their own page and multiple sites are dedicated to the not moms. They are ready to be sterilized and encourage men to undergo a vasectomy. All that to save the planet. There is even a movement called the Movement for the Voluntary Extinction of Humanity. Says Stephanie Iris Weiss, one of these ladies, 
Having a child would increase my greenhouse gases. I love children, but I prefer to sacrifice myself. Following the United Nations and the World Bank, Africa alone will see its population double in the next 30 years. Asia will gain another billion inhabitants by 2050. All what these ladies will gain if ever women were stupid enough to agree with them is send Europe into oblivion. How crazy can you be? Our last topic for this program are the results of the COP21 conference in Paris about climate warming. Oh, sorry, mistake, about climate change. This is our interview. Our guest today is a professor of chemistry at the Belgian University of Louvain. His name is Istvan Marco and he's an observer of um, climatological issues. So uh, our question is related to COP21 in Paris, the conference that ended in November. What are the results as you see them? Essentially nothing. To be fair, um, COP21 is the 21st version of these big meetings. Uh, a lot of people come in there. They were like 30,000, 40,000 people that had to be taken care of. 195 different countries were present. And essentially, these people meet there to discuss about what might happen and what kind of agreement they can come up with. It turns out that, like with the previous COP, COP20 and so on in Copenhagen and so and so forth. Um, this meeting, this meeting, the COP21 meeting in Paris, actually resulted in essentially no result whatsoever. Why? Because if you read very carefully the text, there is absolutely nothing binding in this particular treaty. What happens is that none of the countries are supposed to do anything except their goodwill. So they will provide a certain number of reduction that they are expected to accomplish. But if they don't reach the expected numbers, if they don't reach the decrease in, say, greenhouse gas um, that they promised, there's absolutely nothing there that can prevent them from any bad effect. Nobody can come and tell them, look, you have to do better than that. The only argument to help countries or to push countries to fulfill their wishes or what they will put forward is essentially shame. To my knowledge, no politician knows what shame subject is shame. at all. <laughs> they are totally not subject to shame. So, you know, good wish is one thing, promises is one thing, but very, very seldom do countries fulfill their promises. Okay, so the conference was about um, global warming or, or climate change, let's say, and what they said, what they say is that they are very alarmists. They say that we need to reduce CO2. Do we need to reduce CO2 and other greenhouse gases? Well, th there's a difference between greenhouse gases in general and carbon dioxide. For me, some greenhouses have, of course, a, a very important effect, but the most important greenhouse gas is water. Water is, is really the greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide Yes, carbon dioxide itself is a very, very minor greenhouse, not only in quantity, but also in its effect. It's about 10 times less efficient than water, and it's only 0.04% carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, whereas water is present in 1 to 3% in general. So CO2 is at least 500 times less efficient. Now, in addition to that, carbon dioxide is not a pollutant. Many times I hear that people are claiming carbon dioxide is a pollutant. It's not. Carbon dioxide is, in fact, food for plants. And what we can notice is that, of course, without carbon dioxide, we would not have plants because they rely on photosynthesis to generate the carbohydrates to grow and so on. Everyone who has a greenhouse knows that if you want to grow some plants better, faster, you want them to be bigger, you inject carbon dioxide. In most of the greenhouses, there is like three to four times as much CO2 as in the atmosphere. There are also a lot of studies showing that most of the actual plants living on Earth are depleted of carbon dioxide. They are hungry. 
they are actually starving for more carbon dioxide because previously there had been a lot more CO2 in the atmosphere and plants had to evolve because the, the amount of carbon dioxide decreased. So for the planet itself, it's good to have more carbon dioxide. Moreover, over the past 30 years or so, satellites have been monitoring the greening of the planet. And what we observe is that over this period, about 20% greening has been observed. So the more carbon dioxide, the merrier. Is global warming a reality? Yes and no. Let's put it in a different way. There is no global temperature. It has no meaning per se. There is no global climate. The Earth has not one single climate. Climate is something which is local. And the previous climatologist years ago knew that very well because they talked about a, a Mediterranean climate, they talked about a desertic climate. So every different region on Earth has a different climate. So we cannot consider that the whole planet has exactly the same climate. There are some places in Earth when the temperature reaches minus 80 degrees, whereas at the same moment in time at another part of the planet you will have temperature reaching plus 50 degrees. So a global temperature has no physical meaning whatsoever. So I don't think we have to consider that as a whole entity per se. What we do on a local basis is important. What we are looking at a global place is very different and we cannot just take local temperatures and transform that into something meaningless which is called a global temperature and even more meaningless what is called an anomaly of temperature which is a difference between the whole medium value of all those temperatures minus a whole medium value of a selected period of time which by no means is something where climate has been constant for 30 years. Climate changes continuously. So uh, Europeans have the impression now that there is a, a certain warming, uh, less winter, uh, warmer winters. Is it so? It could well be, because if you think about it, and again, depending on where you are, if you think about it, we have just come out not that long ago from a cold period called the Little Ice Age, a period that started roughly around 1300 and which ended up somewhere around 1850, 1870. So after a cold period, which was not always cold, let's be fair. There was some period of warming, some period colder, some warming and so on. But this was a disastrous period. People died by millions. Um, the, the, the crops did not grow when needed. Sometimes the summer was very, very dry. Sometimes there were huge amount of rain. Sometimes the winter was so cold that the Thame was frozen over four meter depth or the Seine was completely frozen in Paris. And people used to hold their merchandise there. They used to hold the market. They used to to go, you know, skiing or, or yeah. skating on the ice. So after that period of cold, what we what we usually observe is an increase in temperature. And we are just in the leftover of that increase in temperature. We are sort of reaching the top of that period. And because climate oscillates, what happens now is that we have this plateau of nearly 20 years during which temperature has not moved. At least the anomalies of temperature have not changed. So we are reaching this plateau. This plateau is nothing else than the top of a curve. And after the top of a curve, as usually happens, you go down on the slope. So what many scientists now are claiming is that in the next few years, and certainly for the next foreseeable future, 30, 40 years, we are going to see temperatures coming down. And they relate this to the activity of the sun. There have been some very nice uh, contribution recently from a Russian and English team about understanding the way the sun works in, in, in our galaxy and our um, environment and how the effect of this sun impinges on the temperatures in the Earth. And what they have noticed is that for now several years the sun has gone quiet. That means less and less activity of the sun. And clearly the sun is the most important provider of energy for our planet. And you can clearly observe a decrease in the temperature. Meanwhile, the carbon dioxide has kept on increasing. And so this clearly indicates that there is really no correlation between the temperature we measure or we calculate and the amount of carbon dioxide released in the atmosphere.
So what you say is that the next ice age could be around the corner? Well, I wouldn't call that an ice age, but certainly, uh, according to a number of scientists, we are going to reach a lower temperature period. Now, that may be, of course, interspersed with higher temperatures. Sometimes we will have maybe warmer summers. Sometimes we will have a lot more rain. But definitely what people are now suggesting is that the temperatures globally will go down. Now, we can notice already uh, these kind of things. For example, the, uh, the melting of the Arctic um, ice has slowed down since at least 10 years and has been reaching a plateau as well. It's actually quite nice to correlate what happens in the melting of the Arctic sea ice with the plateau of temperature that we are observing. And so the, the Arctic sea ice has been melting ever since we left the Little Ice Age and the temperatures went up. And now what we notice is that for at least 10 years it's been on a plateau. Okay, the, the Earth has been warmer in historical times in the past? Definitely warmer. According to all the studies, what happened was that somewhere like 14,000, 10,000 years ago, we came out of the last ice age. Now, these ice ages usually last about 100,000 years, and so far there have been a number of them. So we left for some obscure reasons, no, people know why these are called the Milankovic cycles. So we left this last Ice Age period and we entered what we call now the Holocene. The Holocene is an interglacial period, so that's a period which is warmer than the others. And this period of warm started much higher in temperature than what we know nowadays. And gradually, since the, the moment we left this um, cold period, the temperatures have been gradually coming down. We have had the Holocene optimum, we have had the Roman optimum, we also much closer to us, we had the, um, the Middle Age optimum, which was a period where the Vikings went to Greenland and the Vikings actually called it Greenland for a very specific reason and they lived there until the temperatures cooled down again and we entered the Little Ice Age. At that period, of course, they could not grow their cereals, they could not raise their cattle there, and they had to leave, and those who didn't left, of course, died over there because the, the whole thing collapsed, of course. The, the, the ice went up, the temperatures went down, they had no food, so basically they died there. So if we don't need, actually, like the climate alarmists say in Paris, if we don't need to reduce CO2, all the, um, the talk about the new renewable energies is, is useless. It is, in the sense that what we have to do is not look after CO2. CO2 is not a culprit in any ways. Carbon dioxide, as I said, is food for plants, and without plants there would not be any life on Earth, and certainly we would not exist. So we need carbon dioxide. People tend to forget that uh, up to 70% of the oxygen we breathe come from the decomposition of carbon dioxide by small marine microorganisms called phytoplanktons. They generate that. So carbon dioxide, for me, is more like a molecule of life than anything else. Now, concerning energy, it's a different matter. Of course, we have fossil fuels, we have nuclear energy, and it's quite understandable that people want to move away from these kind of energies to something which they call renewable. Now, the only renewable energy I would agree calling renewable is hydroelectric energy or, for example, thermal energy like in, in uh, Iceland, for example. Photovoltaic uh, energy or energy produced by using windmills is certainly not renewable. It's just intermittent. That's not the same thing. If you don't have wind, you don't have electricity. If you don't have sun, you don't have electricity. So. Every time you use a windmill, every time you have to use photovoltaic cells, you of course need some backup energy generation. And these backup energy generation are essentially gas-fired power plants. And so they will have to go on and off and on and off according to the demand. And that generates even more pollution than without uh, the, the um, let's say, the windmills or the photovoltaic cells. So this is one part of the problem. The other part of the problem lies in the fact that green energy per se is living on subsidies. 
And if you don't have subsidies, and this is where I disagree with the way the governments are acting in the European Union and elsewhere in the world, they provide money to people to encourage the use of green energy. But this is now completely uh, um, modifying the, the free market itself, which is not a good thing. If it was so good, we wouldn't need these subsidies. Now, the companies know that, so they are eager to get the subsidies. That's far easier than be original, than be creative. So the moment the subsidies disappear, these companies disappear as well. And that's what we are seeing everywhere in the world. Okay, so um, if we don't need to go over to renewable energies and if we don't need to reduce CO2, um, how do you see the future? Do you, can we hope that governments will open their eyes and realize over time that alarmists are going much too far? I think they will gradually. Um, there are several things that, that are going to, to happen, but to, to say something about energy itself, what we should do is, of course, act in a, in a responsible, intelligent way. For example, we can use methods to avoid um, spending energy for nothing. I mean, someone said the, the, the best energy is the one you didn't use. So if you look at the houses, if you look at the common buildings, if you look at, at all those places, provided you protect them from losses, provided you, you put correct uh, surrounding inside, you will not lose your energy. You will not have to use as much energy. So decreasing the amount of energy we are using by adapting uh, the way we build the houses and so on is something very intelligent to do. Throwing money out at windmills or photovoltaic cells is definitely not an intelligent solution. This is something that is just based on green lobbies and this is based on the number of circuits which where people are actually sinking the money in, sucking the money. This is like a bonus and they don't have to worry about it. Now what will gradually happen is that research will move on and I have a lot of faith in the fact that we may end up with something gradually better. But for the foreseeable future, certainly for the next decades or so, I don't see how people can get rid of neither nuclear energy nor uh, fossil fuel itself. Professor Marco, that will be the end. Thank you very much uh, for, for this interview and uh, thank you all for watching us and uh, see you next time.